Hi, and welcome to News Talker, the WIC Communications papers of Southern Arizona talking about all the things in our communities and in your communities as well. I'm Matt Hickman, Managing Editor of the Herald Review Media in Sierra Vista, Arizona, joined today, as always, by Dan Shear, Managing Editor of the Green Valley News, Tom Botus, Managing Editor of the Eastern Arizona Courier and the Copper Era, as well as Nogales International Publisher, Manuel Coppola. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining me so much. Got through all that with remembering everybody's name without getting too far ahead of myself. But how could you not get up too far ahead of yourself? Because we are almost to primary season. The real votes will start counting. July 3rd is the beginning of early voting. So people who get their ballots in the mail have up until July 30th to vote or to vote at the polls by July 30th. Uh, that means if you want to be part of this very important election season, you have to be registered by July 1 uh, to be eligible to vote in the July 30 primary. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the importance you see in um, in, uh, in in voting. And, uh, it, you know, maybe there's some areas in, in some places you guys know where in your particular areas where people can go sign up to vote if they uh, if they haven't already. Dan, you want to just give us a couple of pointers there, what you, what you know out there? You know, I met some people this week who um, were from out of state and um, they couldn't even tell me who the governor of their state was. And I encouraged them to not vote this year. And I know that goes contrary to everything we tell people, get out there and vote, vote, vote. But that comes with being informed. And so at, this is the time to get informed. So when that ballot's in front of you, uh, which could happen within days for a lot of us, uh, that you actually know what you're you're talking about. Uh, so to that point, I just want to add one thing, that if you're going down the ballot and you say, gosh, I just don't know anybody in this race, it's okay to skip a race. You don't have to um, vote in every single one of them. They're not going to toss your ballot out. So uh, bone up on the issues and the people and then, um, uh, and then vote. But if you don't know, it's okay just to sit this one out. Yes, yeah, so we can get caught up real fast reading any of our fine uh, WIC communications papers. We'll get you caught up on uh, all the politics and everything else real quick and the who's who. But let's go ahead and jump into the races here. Uh, July 3rd, what, what, what are we seeing in your areas that are going to be hot races that are either partisan races where you're going to decide who your Republican or Democratic candidate is going to be for November? Or in a lot of cases in more local races, they're just settling it right here and now in nonpartisan races uh, in July. Uh, Manuel, let's start out with you. What's uh, what's going on in the, uh, what, what are we looking for next month out of uh, Nogales area? I think he's got the long COVID. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go on to you, Tom. It looks like uh, Manuel's frozen there a little bit. Tom, what, are you, what what's going on? What's hot in uh, Greenlee Graham counties? Well, the weather to start with, but uh, <laughs> beyond that, uh, uh, the only race in Graham County that's going to be settled in the primaries is the sheriff race. We've got two Republicans running and uh, only one's going to come out of that. So that the, we'll know who the sheriff is after the primary out in Greenlee County. Uh, none of, none of the races are going to be settled, but there we, we will eliminate one sheriff candidate out there though. we got four running and uh, one of them will be eliminated in the primary. The other two are, uh, one's an independent, one's a Democrat. So that's still going to be in question come November. But otherwise, it's uh, there's a couple ballot propositions I'm aware of out there, but they're, you know, more or less paperwork, bookkeeping type uh, formalities. And uh, nothing much going on out here. Otherwise, everything else is going to be either uncontested or when uh, we start getting the school board and other races like that coming up and that's we'll see that in November. Dan, what about uh, Green Valley Sarita? What's uh, what's hot? Well, actually, I'm going to focus on uh, Pima County because one of the uh, most hotly contested races will be settled in the primary, and that is for Pima County attorney. We have two Democrats, Mike Jetty and incumbent Laura Conover, and they have been meeting in uh, forums, and there's been a lot of back and forth on the opinion pages. Uh, Jetty has a lot of support from what we will call the Barbara Lawal squad. She was the former long time Pima County attorney who uh, recently in our paper and several others said Laura Conover is flat out lying about uh, a, lot, a lot of things that she's been saying to the press. So this one is definitely a gloves off race. And I don't know that a lot of people realize this thing will be decided here in the next few weeks. And so it's one to pay attention to. Uh, Sawarita Town Council will be decided in the primary 
four candidates, four open spots. This one is not anything we're going to be spending a lot of time on. But then we're also going to come down to our uh, general election sheriff candidates. Uh, we have two Democrats and three Republicans running for that, and that's getting uh, pretty tight too. So, um, so we have a lot going on. The primary, which a lot of people just dismiss or don't partake in, is really going to be um, have have a lot of action this year for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that um, sheriff race. We picked that up from your site, put it on our site. It's gotten a lot of traction. People, you know, in Cochise County are very interested in what sheriffs everywhere think. You know, in, in the border region in general. Uh, there's also a woman running in that race, and I was just thinking out loud. I couldn't think. I can't think of a woman ever being elected sheriff anywhere in the country. And would this and, be a first there? And I believe she said that her name is Heather Lappin. She currently works for the Phoenix County Sheriff's Department in the, in corrections, and she's out there. Um, she, if she wins the GOP primary, she will be facing her boss, Chris Nanos, in the uh, general election. If he wins the Democratic primary, and uh, Smart Money says that those two are the ones whose uh, names are going to be on the ballot in November. But you're exactly right, uh, first female. Uh, but at this point. Uh, people just want somebody who can actually get in there and do the job. And um, I have been debates uh, to debates involving all of the candidates and uh, they're, you know, they got their talking points and everything. But if you look close, there are big differences among the candidates. So uh, as you pointed out earlier, read our coverage because it's all right there. Yeah, and before we kick it on over to uh, Manuel about uh, Nogales races, a candidate we all share in uh, Congressional District 6 is Juan Siscomani, freshman. Uh, he's running against um, Kathleen Wynn, uh, who went against him two years ago, picked up 18% of the vote in the primary. Uh, another fellow, uh, Brandon Martin, got a little bit ahead, 20.1. But if you put the two in, a lot of people think Wynn has no chance against Siskamani, him being uh, the incumbent, um, bring a lot of money to the area and c completely outspending her. But you kind of wonder, because as you're saying, these are primaries, these are not elections. You, th This is not the time to be centrist. This is not the time to be everybody's candidate. In a primary, especially in this charge environment, especially on the Republican Party, do you think Siskamani's in any danger uh, in a Republican primary? Throw that to you, Dan. I don't think he's in danger in a Republican primary in uh, the least. Um, uh, I spoke with him recently and he pointed out that he's in one of the few competitive congressional districts in the nation. He said out of 435 districts, there are 18 that are truly competitive. His is one of them. That's where the real battle will be. Uh, Christian Engel, who he faced uh, two years ago and beat by a very small margin, is, is back and strong. Uh, we'll see what happens. Kathleen Wynn is a fly buzzing around his head. She is really uh, not an issue uh, in, in the primary. Uh, Manuel, let's talk a little bit about Nogales and Rio Rico and that whole uh, neck of the woods. What's, go what's going on there next month? What's hot? Well, I'll tell you, we've got 23 local candidates and uh, 20, 28 local candidates. And we're trying to interview the majority of them. And it's quite the task. Uh, we were going to do uh, video interviews in that, as I explained before, but that all kind of went by the wayside. Uh, um, so we're doing sit down interviews with them. And uh, it's, it's interesting. It, it's great to see the participation, but uh, the talking points aren't very different that I can tell. And um, the big curveball that the incumbents have at the, county, the Board of Supervisors in particular, is this whole embezzlement uh, allegation against the uh, former county treasurer. Uh, we're starting to see uh, reports from the Auditor General from 2017 that uh, red flagged a lot of things that apparently never got addressed or didn't get addressed uh, adequately. And so we've got what we've got now, I think, for million dollars is just the tip of the iceberg of what they're going to find missing and so people are wondering you know what were the board of super what was the board of supervisors doing where where's the oversight and it's easy to point fingers at the uh former county manager for example but they have just as much to do with uh, this thing going on as long as it did in my opinion yeah coaches county so there's going to be some backlash yeah, 
that that'll be interesting to watch. Also, Coaches County, we have a, some really competitive and just really interesting and colorful mayoral races in some of our smaller communities. Uh, out in Douglas, we have uh, the person uh, Don Hewish, the very well known, well respected uh, mayor, is stepping down, not running for re-election. Uh, so uh, George Grijalva is uh, would seem to be the uh, next in place, but he had a late writing candidate come against him when a very uh, kind of bombastic business owner of Borderland Chevrolet by the name of Mark Mermis, who's uh, quite the firebrand, uh, a newcomer to the area. So he's promising to bring all kinds of new revitalization to Douglas, and he's doing it in a writing campaign. Uh, it's gotten very kind of nasty with Mermis making comments about Grijalva's uh, uh, disabilities he's legally blind and so forth so it's gotten very very ugly uh so we'll see what goes on there you go right up the road to bisbee you know you have the incumbent ken budge who seems to be fairly well liked but you have a challenger in gretchen bonaducci the ex-wife of uh reality TV star Danny Bonaducci, uh, and she's very mixed up in the, you know, in the, in the scene of the, the, the kind of social scene in Bisbee. Uh, so you have, so she's running and, you know, we're not, well, we actually, I'm, I'm a part of a debate tonight. I'm doing the videography for a debate tonight they're holding in Bisbee. So it'll be interesting to see what her actually policy positions are on why people should replace Ken Budge. And maybe the most colorful is out in Tombstone. And I don't know if you guys have seen any of our coverage there. This guy who started this event called uh, Tombstone Revolution, which is based on a video game, kind of a reenactment, was a big hit. Uh, out out of that, he ended up fighting with city hall and city government so badly that he decided to run for mayor. And uh, then in recent weeks, he because then he said he was going to fire the marshal if elected. And then he had a conversation with the marshal and the mayor, Dusty Escapool, who's been the mayor for 25 straight years. And he claims that they more or less intimidated him and out of running for the race. And so he's uh apparently said in his last thing his op-ed he wrote to our paper on sunday that he is out of the race but he is not officially out of the race uh you have to go through some paperwork to get your name taken off the ballot and he refuses to do that he says no he's in the race so we don't know whether he's in the race but these are three very colorful races to watch it'll all be decided uh july 30th um you know and then things like and you have races like that it kind of brings us around to what we were talking about here uh you can get a lot of misinformation you have a couple candidates just going around social media you know saying things about each other a lot of operator game around town it makes it really important to have you know a, a news source a, an objective news source that can kind of play referee and be the kind of you know the, the bedrock people can go to to say oh well people said that people said that this is more likely to be more true. Uh, what, what are you guys seeing as far as like, and Dan, let's, let's go to you. I know you've, you, you've kind of looked into this a little bit about, you know, there's a, a lot of fake media out there and some media that's maybe not fake per se, but it is, it's, a, it's definitely driven by money and a particular political interest. What, 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 what are you seeing out there, Dan? Well, a report came out last week that says that there are now more partisan websites passing themselves off as legitimate media outlets uh, than there are American newspaper sites. Let me give you one quote from that story, and it's from NewsGuard, and NewsGuard does research and grades the veracity of news sites, and uh, they're very highly respected. The quote is, the odds are now better than 50-50 that if you see a news website purporting to cover local news, it's fake. And so that is just the, the, the warning for readers out there to understand that there's a lot of fakes out there, in fact, more than legitimate media sites. So know what you're reading, know what their funding is, uh, know what their bent is, and, uh, and, and, and veer away from them if it's something that uh, you're, you're just gonna end up not trusting. Are they telling the full story? Are they even telling the story? The best way to, uh, to censor news is to just not cover it. And so you have to really be a discerning reader and a critical thinker to be able to smoke out one of these sites and to, um, and to make sure that you're getting accurate, fair news coverage so you can make a good decision. Okay. A word that's kind of come into the vernacular recently to describe this is pink slime, which is, gets its name from, you know, 20, 30 years ago, the, this additive they were using to make cheap semi-fake meat look more passable. Uh, so that's kind of the equivalent of what they're saying. This is what it's doing to news. Um, you know, and a lot of these things, um, a lot of the stuff you're mentioning, the stuff, hyper-political stuff, 
uh, kind of comes from a national or international level. It might be coming from Russia or Iran, who knows. But the uh, are, we, are we seeing anything like this locally in your local markets where there's just news sources or things that pass themselves off as the news sources that just aren't reliable? I'm not seeing anything down my way, but uh, the best defense, I think, is to have uh, a vibrant local news community, right? To have your radio station, your uh, public public radio stations and whatnot. I think we're, we kind of insulate ourselves from the fake sites if we're that, if we have that condition. We are, we are still seeing it though on a, um, on a national, I mean, or, or on a state level, I should say, uh, let's look at, um, Arizona mirror, which is, uh, run, uh, the editor is Jim small, one of the best editors in Arizona, but they unabashedly lean left. Uh, during the redistricting, they did the best coverage hands down of anybody in the state, but um, they are uh, a left leaning site. And so they are going to be um, championing or covering more heavily the issues that the, that uh, Democrats probably are more interested in. And if a Republican does something good, you're probably not going to see it on their site. Um, so what you see there is generally pretty solid, but you have to understand that there's a lot you're not seeing. And so not to pick on them because there certainly is, uh, are others also out there that, uh, that lean right, that we pull some statewide coverage. As an editor, we have to be very careful with that type of stuff. Uh, sometimes they're great stories and other times I wouldn't touch them. Uh, but but I'm discerning enough to know what's good and what's not. But it's out there and it's making its way into uh, into mainstream papers. Yeah, and there are a lot of you see a lot of, on the left. You also see things like AZ Luminaria and uh, some other places like a state line, which is kind of like uh, the larger picture of what uh, you know Arizona Mirror is kind of more the local uh, product of state line, which and they and they do some really great content. Um, you sure. know, it's a little bit, it's it's definitely slanted. Um, a lot of it is slanted in tone more so than content. Um, and so you're right. Also, the things they choose not to cover. Uh, sure. I find that the the kind of silence over this uh, investigation into Hobbs and and sure. her uh, possible dealings with that group home uh, funding uh, yeah. has been really it's been really quiet on that. Uh, on the other side, you do have some other things like Center Square, which has come in from uh, obviously getting right wing money, uh, and they do a pretty responsible job of journalism, and it's useful to have. Uh, for content, but obviously it is coming from the, you, you always follow the money, right? And the money is obviously coming from, you know, partisan, partisan uh, spenders. So we, we, yeah, we just have to be really careful as editors, what we use, what we put in front of our readers and then the readers themselves, and they're going directly to these sites have to understand again, who's funding them, where is it coming from? Uh, what, what's, uh, what's their angle? Because, because as this report just showed, and, and I'll give you the numbers, 1,265, uh, what they would call pink slime leaning uh, websites out there, 1,213 legitimate news sites. So uh, there are more of them than there are of us. Well, we're we're all, we're all, go ahead, Tom. Well, there's a lot of people too, though, that rely on the social media for getting their news feeds and whatnot. And that's all based on algorithms. So whatever your predisposition is, that's what you're going to get fed. So if you're not going if you're not aware of what legitimate news is, you're not going to get it from social media because you're going to get what you want. And uh, trying to convince people that uh, what they're seeing is not necessarily on the up and up is a challenge sometimes. All right. It seems Facebook is doing a better job, it seems. They're, they're a lot more discerning than they were four years ago or eight years ago um, in what they allow. Uh, they're, they're, they're very, it seems like they're really quick to take things down, even if they're only slightly objectionable. Yeah. To, to, uh, to Tom's point, though, now we have to ask, are people in the future going to even want balanced objective coverage or are they going to look for coverage that reinforces their viewpoint and that's that and so that's going to completely redefine really what people are after anymore we think they want objective coverage but i would say that in in the next 10 years or so we may see all of that go out the window remember we're losing in this country two newspapers every week and and so we're losing the battle for objectivity and fairness uh, and balance and that's uh that's that's scary
that is scary. Well, I think in community newspapers, one advantage that papers like ours have is that we are biased. We are biased for our town, whether it's Sierra Vista, Nogales. So we're for business, you know, new business. We want to do a story. We want to see business succeed. We want to see, you know, stories of success, whether it's sports or what have you. So we're very, you know, we are we are we are very uh, slanted toward that, um, regardless of anything political. So I think maybe that is maybe the cornerstone, because if you go, if you do have the, the thing that maybe it's not objectivity they want, but they want they, they want to know the truth about where they live and their own, you know, the, the team they root for, which is their hometown. Right. Right. And I think I don't know that I'd use the word slanted, but I would use the word. I'm, I'm more optimistic. Yeah, I, I, I would use the word mission. We know what our mission is and uh, and we stick to it. Our mission is local news because in most of our markets, no one else is doing it, at least not anybody uh, reliable. That's right. And that goes to the point I was making before. We kind of insulate ourselves in that manner. But uh, in this day, and age, I'm not as uh, pessimistic as you are, Dan or, or <laughs> Matt. Uh, I think there, there are people out there that do want objectivity. And so how do we, what's best practices for somebody there? Uh, we want it. We want it now. We want it fast. Uh, what is what's best practices for somebody that's looking for balanced news coverage? Well, you know, it's interesting because uh, immediate thing I thought, and I thought about a piece you guys did the other day uh, in Nogales about asylum seekers that was long is long pieces. But even that, you know, uh, yes. you do long pieces, you're taken more seriously. Although there are a lot of things like the Arizona Center for um, Investigative Research, they do a lot of stuff that winds up on AZ Mirror stuff. That we've run some of their stuff. They do good work. Uh, again, it's long, but it, and it is, it does, you know, it does come, it's paid for by money that has an agenda. But um, I think there's something to be said for long form seriousness. You know, uh, I have been asking myself this question for about 20 years, and that is how do we take the nuts and bolts of what we do and make sure that we aren't losing readers? Because uh, for, I'll give you an example. We are rarely ever at our school board meetings. We check out the agendas all the time. We call people. But in the past, you would give wall to wall coverage on really what is largely a boring but important uh, to some people uh, agenda out of, out of the schools. And, and most people just didn't even want that. And so uh, you, you, taking some of the stuff that used to take up a lot of space in the paper and now just going shorter with it and making sure that you're in tune with not only what your readers want, but also what they need and then to repackage. I like the long form journalism, but we also have to know that the day in, day out nuts and bolts also have to be covered. And so it's a balancing act with diminished staffs and um, and revenue. It's it's a tough it's a tough gig, but it's a worthy fight. Well, the trick that the, the, you bring up a point though about the school board meetings, we do the uh, when you're. I understand the you know we can't cover everything, and certainly school board meetings look more expendable. But then you you know the old story that when the cat's away, and because we're not paying as a close of attention to those things as we used to, things are things happen now that. They wouldn't get away with in the past and and that's uh this is where sourcing comes in though is that if you know your community and people in your community they're going to call and let you know things but again we check the agendas sometimes we, we will review them because a lot of them are streamed and uh but to send someone to a four-hour meeting and come away with a couple of briefs that really i could have written off the agenda not a good use of our time and so right. it's like this that we have always had to consider and reconsider in this business to ensure that we are uh, using our resources uh, most efficiently. It is a tough thing. And the way I do it might be different than the way you do it or Manuel does it or Matt does it. All right. Well, we probably should wrap this up, but why don't we go around on the horn one more time and everybody make a prediction about uh, one prediction about the July primaries. Uh, Manuel, let's kick it off with you. I'll pass. <laughs> Grijalva wins re-election, though, I take it. Right, right. <laughs> All right, you got that one. <laughs> Tom, what do you, what, what's your call? Well, I don't think uh, there's really much to predict here. I think, well, the favorite in the local sheriff race in Graham County is uh, the incumbent, P.J. Allred. So, uh, I mean, smart money is going to bet on him, but the uh, I think the Gre Greenlee County Sheriff's race is still pretty wide open, so I'm I'm reluctant to make any calls there. 
everything else, most of that's either there's only one person running on a post. So there's, I mean, I could predict all those and be safe as milk, but uh, most of the interesting races are going to be in November when they start getting the um, school board seats and what have you. Yeah, Dan? I would say that on July 2nd, I'm going to get a lot of phone calls saying, hey, when is the voter registration deadline for the primary? And I'm going to say <laughs> it was yesterday, July 1. So because uh, that happens every election cycle. So, uh, Yeah, pro probably the hottest race in Cochise County is everybody looks at Tom Crosby, currently under state indictment for uh, his role in the 2022 failure to canvass the election. Uh, he has a huge primary challenge from Clint Brasenio, a very popular local uh, businessman for years here. Uh, I'm going to predict Brasenio defeats Crosby, which will wow. be a relief to a lot of people in the judicial system who, because if he is convicted of a felony or if he is later, uh, he could later be removed for, uh, you know, uh, breaking open meeting laws. So this would save everybody a lot of trouble if Brasenio were just to beat Crosby. And I just think Brasenio has everywhere you go in town, you see him and he's shaking someone's hand. So I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and pick, uh, I don't know if it's an upset, but I'm picking Brasenio over, uh, over Crosby. But again, get gentlemen, great conversation. Uh, let's do this again real soon. And everybody, uh, make sure to get registered to vote by July 1st, unless Dan doesn't think you should vote, then just, uh, <laughs> just call, me. call me. I'll tell you how to vote. There. All right. Well, thanks for joining the news talker and everybody have a good day.